Welcome to Bite-Sized Agency Briefs, a webinar series that packs a ton of important agency information on one topic from one expert into a 25-minute brief. Why 25 minutes? Because who has the attention span for much more these days? And you can squeeze in a listen between meetings with time for a bathroom break or coffee refill before your next meeting. Thanks for tuning in. This is Bite Sized Agency Briefs. I'm your host, Steve Guberman from Agency Outsight, where I coach agency owners to build the agency of their dreams. Uh, I'm excited to be talking today with Khalil Stoltz from Lima Capital Partners among other entrepreneurial ventures that we'll dig into. Uh, Khalil is an acquisition entrepreneur, an investor, and a growth consultant. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. Yeah, so all the different hats and ventures you've got going on, talk about you know how you got where you are and really what you're up to. Yeah, um, I think uh, what's kind of led to you know several of my ventures and so forth has been the the question, you know, how can I do things better, right? How can I get the the highest leverage or use of my time? So mm-hmm. um, my background's in business development and sales enablement. I started out in the transportation logistics space in corporate America, cold calling 150 calls a day um, to build a book of business. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure, right? Uh, no pressure, but ton of gray hair. So um but with cold call 150 calls a day with the goal of building a book of business transportation clientele um i was at a company that had 3000 sales reps and brokers um nationwide my office in particular had 100 sales reps so um there was there was not only a lot of external competition but a lot of internal competition so uh in other words if somebody had that company tag could i couldn't pursue them so the question mm-hmm. became okay look i i got to cold call 150 calls a day for weeks and months on end get a get a good account some of these larger accounts enterprise level accounts could take two years to close quite literally Mm -hmm. i started thinking i was like okay how can i how can i do things a little better here you know because i always have to rinse and repeat this model to grow um and i finally got the idea at you know while i was in this position okay why don't i instead of just focusing on prospects why don't i pursue other companies that already have a pool of vetted clients and I can become their fulfillment arm. In other words, partner with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that worked out phenomenally well. I started closing a ton of quick relationships that had big accounts. Um, and that grew my book of business exponentially. So springboarding that forward, eventually, you know, I went into insurance, became an insurance agent. And from there, got the entrepreneurial bug. Um, and my first attempt at really being an entrepreneur was to try and buy a $7 million trucking company. Um, and my thought process was, okay, if I'm going to be an entrepreneur, you know, I have a lot of skill sets. I can grow stuff. I'm great at sales, um, great at processes in that regard. I can try and build something from scratch or can find something that's already built and add to Mm -hmm. it. That was my logic. Um, you know, so my first attempt was to try and buy a $7 million trucking company. So swing for the fences. Uh, yeah, let's let's not let's not even go with the fact that, you know, I just left my job. So I didn't exactly have a million dollars in my bank account at the time to close on a seven figure acquisition. Right. So I went ahead and got a credit partner to try and fund the deal. Um, turned out that the business owner had a divorce and a non-compete legal battle back to back. So it made the business unfundable, basically. Banks looked at it and said, uh, no, thanks. Mm-hmm. Rightfully so. It makes sense. So you have multiple six figures in legal fees per year that you're still paying off going to hinder cash flow, um, yeah. uh, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, so basically, I was left in a position where I couldn't fund it traditionally, uh, but I had to get creative. So I was really motivated to try and get a deal done. So uh, what I was able to do was after looking at the business owner's financial infrastructure, I was able to rearrange how he structured a few things in the business without having to fire anyone. And I was able to add about $880,000 back to his net bottom line cash. Uh, wow. Just by making some simple tweaks. And that was without any additional growth strategy or anything. It was just optimization. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that springboarded me into a lot of things I would do there and after. I then took a um, acquired equity stake in a digital marketing agency, a B2B lead generation agency. Um, literally 10x the business. Um, in a span of four months in particular, I grew the company 240% just through strategic partnership development. Um, but it all kind of springboarded off that same mindset, you know, how can I do things better? Right. Um, and I realized kind of with my personal wealth goals, 
you know, as an entrepreneur, um, you look at some of the most widely known entrepreneurs, their biggest wealth happened from some form of capital event or exit. Yeah. Right? Elon Musk, he sold PayPal. Richard Brunson, you know, sold Virgin. Um, Bill Gates, he went public with Microsoft. Some form of liquidity event happened to take them to that level of, of wealth that we're all aware of. Amazon, public, you know, publicly traded stuff. So there's some form of liquidity event, typically speaking. Um, so that was kind of my logic. Like if I want to accelerate wealth, you know, I want to mm-hmm. want to accelerate not only income, but capital events. Well, right. a better way to do that um, than take something that's already existing as opposed to having to rebuild things from scratch um, and add value to them. I mean, again, even Elon Musk does the same thing, right? Even Tesla, yep. he didn't, that wasn't a new concept. He actually acquired it and then added his values to it, right? He's mm-hmm. still going through that process with Twitter, you know, and several of the companies he had, he's gone through that same model. So that was kind of my logic, you know, what's the highest leverage I can get for my effort and time in building wealth, if that makes sense. Yeah. So now, so you, so now you're not running the trucking company, you, you've, Sold off the digital marketing agency, or are you still running that? No, sold off majority stakes, so no longer running okay. that. Um, now I have multiple ventures and so forth that I have equity stakes in, et cetera. Okay. And so you spend some time advising owners of agencies and other businesses on mergers and acquisitions, right? Yep, and growth strategy, mergers, acquisition, and business development, growth through strategic partnerships as well. Yeah. And listen, I'm all in on strategic partnerships and, you know, through my time owning an agency and coaching other agencies. And it's like, all right, you can go direct to, you know, finding a million clients or you can find a few partners who are doing their own hunting for you. Yes. It's just a no brainer. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, fully, fully there with you, man. Yeah. I want to talk about positioning an agency for acquisition and, and what does that look like? Because and I and I said this before I hit the record button, I've had more conversations about mergers and acquisitions in the past month than I have in my entire life. And I've gone through two, you know, one on either either side of the equation. And there's just, you know, growth through acquisition is all has always been a great thing. But it seems like it's very popular now. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of agencies that I'm working with, even if they don't want to in their three to five year vision, become acquired, you know, the DNA of a nicely acquirable business is just a healthy business. So what are some of those things that you you work with uh, companies on? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, to your point, Steve, um, if you're not looking to exit right now, be sellable. Um, mm-hmm. Radically change your business where you are today, regardless. Know your numbers. Mm-hmm. Know your business. Um, you know, I had a mentor of mine. He would always say, you know, you want to transition from just focusing on customer values and focus on shareholder value, right? Uh, And that's a different perspective. Um, You want to start, you know, people put it this way, you know, don't just be in the business, you know, but work on the business, et cetera. Um, So things like like I mentioned, know your numbers, know know your KPIs. Really take a step back and and audit what this business takes to operate. Because we we as entrepreneurs downplay that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, when I ask, you know, an owner, you know, how much time do you spend in the business? All right. What's the net profit of the business? Oh, I spend 40 hours, 50 hours a week. And the net profit is this. Not realizing that you as a CEO are probably doing three jobs, mm-hmm. right? but you're being paid for one typically, you know, so those numbers need to be factored in for an end buyer right? to get yeah. an actual clear picture of what this really takes for this business to operate without you. Right. And most business owners, I think that we've no- a lot of a lot of times we normalize our involvements in the business, not realizing that if you remove you from the business, even for a couple of weeks, the whole thing collapses. Right. So it's putting your business in a position as a, you know, the vacation test. Yep. Just, right. That type of mentality is, is very beneficial. Right. If I went on vacation for two weeks with no email, cell phone, no Slack, no notion, no click up. None of those things. Uh, what systems would need to be in place that this could efficiently run still if nobody could reach me? Yeah. And I literally just had that conversation last week with a client. She went away for a week and the build up to her being able to go away for a week was what do we need to put in place and what is the PM going to do and how is it going to be managed? And when she came back, she was like, the place didn't burn down. It kept going. I said, that's ideal. That's That's the first part. The second part is 
can it grow without you there? Yes. That's a whole other ball yeah. of wax. I don't know if you're, that's where you were going with it, but you know, yeah. Being yeah. able to take that vacation. That's it. If you could take a vacation and the business is still standing and growth happened, you're in a, you're in a good spot. So, mm -hmm. and the other part is documentation. How do all those things work? You know, really from, from an internal perspective, you've been in the business, you've probably built this thing from the ground up. So, you know, it's intricacies, right? But somebody coming into the business, it could be like Ikea furniture. I'm like, okay, where does this piece fit? How does this flow? Yep. So forth. Little nuances we take for granted that when the owner is removed, again, collapse could happen. Um, you know, you'd be surprised the little things like, okay, when a client's onboarded, oh yeah, so you know, the onboarding specialist does this, but then the owner does this little part here. You'd be surprised you remove the owner without any documentation and everything stops right there. And you're weeks in and you look back like, wait, where's the prop? Where's the holdup? Yeah. All right. So documentation is key, both visually and in written format. Even video, if you can, like SOPs, hugely important and increases the value of the business. Um, some other things, having things like a general manager, even fractionally, is, mm -hmm. a, is a great look for business from an exit. It, that adds a pretty good amount of exit value to be able to say you have a functioning general manager or an ops person. Again, even fractionally, that can yeah. you know, help oversee some things. So. Yeah, that if that right hand person, the COO or ops ops manager, like you mentioned, they know the ins and outs. You know, they need to, they need to be somewhat of a mirror of the owner, and yes. the owner is obviously still responsible for their own part of things. But it makes that week long vacation or the month long vacation or whatever the heck they want to do every Friday or whatever, it makes that stuff go smoother. Yes. But from an, you're saying from a sellable standpoint. You've now got two people that know the ins and outs of the business, and you can take one. You can basically kick one out if you want, or buy one out if you want. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll even say this. You know, I would, I strongly, I, I highly suggest and believe in that um, acquisition should be a growth arm to a business. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't decide to move forward with an, with acquiring another company, you should go through that process of evaluating a company for acquisition. It's going to really open your eyes to, you know, what's interesting and, you know, what needs to happen. Right. If you if you had another six or seven figure business dropped into your lap that you're now responsible for, along with your current business, what would you need for that thing to still run? Right. That's a great way to start opening up your thought process and say, OK, we need this in this business. We need that. So forth. That's interesting. And I've never really thought about it from that standpoint, that even if you don't want to grow through bringing on and acquiring another agency, you're saying go through it, go through the exercise of digging into somebody else's business and exploring if you overnight doubled in size. Yeah. Can you manage it? How would it work? What would your plan be? Exactly. I mean, it's going to tell you a lot. And I've, again, I would strongly suggest adding acquisition or at least mergers. I love yeah. Of strategic mergers, um, yeah. I mean, again, especially with, when you're merging with another like-minded finder uh, founder, right? They want to be in the game as long as you, or maybe they want to exit like you do, right? You got somebody else who's still running their own ship, but your exit value increases just from that merger. Not to mention yeah. potentially cross-sell opportunities. You know, if it's a synergistic client base that they have, I mean, just so many values are triggered. From something that's just like even a strategic merger. So I would even, you know, strongly suggest you're a six or seven figure business. You're looking for more creative ways to grow. And that's way cheaper than client acquisition. I mean, mm -hmm. you merge with the company, maybe you create a new LLC to put them in that costs a couple hundred bucks, you know, um, and you got a really good new partner. Again, you guys can run things like you were before, but the difference is now a whole lot more exit value has been created just from that merger. So strongly yeah. suggest as a growth channel. Yeah. Listen, as a growth channel, absolutely. But going through the motions, just the exercises without the intention, I think is a really smart thing. Um, yeah. Just to look for holes in process and look for you know gaps in, in talent and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned, you know, key thing is knowing your numbers. What, what, you know, just brass tacks, what are some of those numbers people need to know? Yeah. Client, let's start with client acquisition, KPIs, you know, um, how many, uh, what's your CPL, your cost per lead, right? Your cost per opt-in, um, you know, how is the marketing, uh, what, how's the marketing expenditure being maintained? 
you know, and so forth. How does that affect cash flow? Um, how many, what's your cost per booked appointment? Um, what's your, you know, cost per, you know, acquired client, your CAC, your client acquisition cost. Um, mm -hmm. All those things are highly pertinent to know uh, both internally, just for operations to be able to effectively forecast, but also again, the exit conversation, um, you'd be surprised how many business owners have been functioning and don't know their numbers. So it's a, it, it stands out when you're looking to acquire a company and they, they're on top of their stuff. Um, so yeah. that adds value. It, it gives an end buyer more confidence yep. when acquiring a company, which can give you a few extra points in your valuation, so to speak. Think about like buying a car. If you were on a car lot and the sale, and the sales, you know, the sales rep goes, uh, and, and you ask them, you know, how many miles on the car? You know, let's say if you're looking at a pre-owned car, uh, I don't know. Uh, you're going to feel comfortable. <laughs> Are you are you inclined to pay a higher amount? You know, after that, probably not. Um, yeah. You talk to you know you talk to somebody who knows that car up and down, um, you know, and so forth. It's painting a different picture on the on the on the purchase that you're about to make, um, and it makes you feel more confident. And when you're more confident in a purchase, you're probably willing to pay a bit more, uh, oftentimes. So knowing yeah. your numbers, um, marketing, ops. Right, knowing your ops numbers, or, you know, even uh, ops, you know, sales to ops. Let's say, okay, what's your average sales cycle? What's your retention? What's your churn? Uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, all of those things are, are highly pertinent to know. You know, again, not only for exit, just to operate at, you know, with the most effectiveness. Yeah, I mean, some of those core DNA numbers, they're just good to have them strong, even if you don't want to sell. Um, whether it's, you know, profitability, you know, your, your, Ratio of project to retainer clients, how yes. long those retainer clients have been with you, That's even the idea. even the idea of how long have your employees been with you? You know, do you have massive turnover in, in your talent? Why? Is, is there a culture issue that needs to be addressed? You know, even some of those things that, that aren't. Or a systems issue. Even, a system, or systems systems issue. Is, yeah. even with retention. You know, that, that's yeah. a big one. Too. You know, you could have great talent. And great culture, but bad systems or bad processes, um, it's going to hinder you know your retention for sure. Yeah. When you when you're going through an acquisition, do you keep the owner and senior leadership in place, or does it really just depend on the scenario? Yeah, ideal idealistically, you want to keep you know if if the you know leadership is competent, you know uh, if they're doing a good job, yeah, you want to keep them around. You know, yeah. now if it's a problem employee or, you know, and so forth, then that's a different conversation. But um, in terms of acquisition, yeah, you want to you want to have a transitionary period with the owner uh, or the former owner um, to get, you know, some level of support to, you know, smoothly transition um, as much as possible. Yeah. So so post acquisition, stick around for a year or whatever it might be to help with that transition of clients. Typically, on a, at least on a smaller agency side, the owner is the head of the accounts. The owner is the head of business development. So they're the yeah. face of the agency. And so you've got to, it's a transition period for that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. especially if, if, if it's a very owner-faced brand, so to speak. Um, yeah. Definitely, uh, you want to make sure you navigate that very systematically, um, you know, and set rightful expectation. Because again, yes, yeah, especially if they're on the, on the client side a lot, you know, and you have reoccurring paying contracts and so forth. Um, there could be a risk to those contracts if, you know, boop, you know, the former face is gone that they trusted in, you know, those businesses where they trust in the owner more than the, the actual name of the company or, or the systems. Yep. And the owner's gone, you, you could have a problem, you know, as the, as the new acquirer. So. Yeah, I mean, that was a lot of my experience. You know, we brought the clients along and they were like, yeah, we'll come along with you. But I don't know if they would have, if I just dumped the folders on the new owner's desk, if they would have stuck around or not. Um, so for all all the agency owners that are listening right now, all of them, let's say they want to start having those conversations about, man, I'd love to sell. You know, they've built this agency into this, you know, optimal running machine. The pipeline is full. The numbers are strong. I mean, do they just call you? Do they go knocking on other agency doors? Do they go and get a valuation? Like what's typically the process in your experience? 
Yeah, I would definitely say, hey, uh, reach out. Let's have a conversation. I'm happy to help and kind of walk through those processes with you. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, A, start thinking about some of those things. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of getting help in any endeavor. Um, typically speaking, mm-hmm. when I start a new, first thing I do is I look for some form of coach or guidance from someone who's been there. Um, you know, uh, because again, you know, time is a valuable thing. It's a, it's, it's yeah. not a renewing asset, so to speak. You know, you can only increase the value of the time that you have. Um, and what better way to do maximize your time than learning from someone who's already been there. Um, so that's usually my first go-to with any endeavor. Let me go get some help, you know, and not get some help to, first. Yeah. Trying to figure everything out from scratch. So, yeah, that's also a core element of, you know, just a shining, um, personality point that here's a person that doesn't know what the heck they don't know. So let me find somebody that's been there and done it and can guide me along in the way as opposed to, ah, I'll figure it out. Cool. Waste your time doing that. Yeah. yeah, and and valuation at that a lot of times as well because uh, again, just having someone to pinpoint those things, um, especially when you don't normally think that way, you're normally focused in your business. So having someone who's more consistently focusing on businesses is going to help complement you a lot. Yeah, and somebody from the outside that can get a whole new perspective. I think that's priority. It's super essential. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, all right, I want to shift gears real quick because time flies. Uh, just a couple of random rapid fire questions for you. So, um, what was a big lesson that you learned in 2022 that made you change the way you're doing things in 2023? Great question. Um, I think, um, again, it's kind of going back to that partnership idea. I love, I'm, I'm more and more focusing on, um, for myself personally, um, partial acquisitions you know, supporting businesses that already have a strong founder and so forth, as opposed to um, uh, completely buying out larger scale entities myself or with a few of my partners. Um, Mm. Just, you know, it allows me to focus on my zone of genius, you know, and focusing on a business. So that's one big thing for me. Um, You know, we also are, um, you know, something I'm doing is, you know, also with certain business models, I'm starting to say, hey, look, I'm focusing more on things like e-commerce, SaaS, and so forth, Um, you know, uh, because those are more productized style business deliverables. Um, Now, I still partner with, you know, service-based businesses, et cetera, and so forth. But in terms of my own portfolio, and so to speak, it's uh, now more of a focus on SaaS and e-com. Dig that. Very cool. Business or otherwise related, what is a show or a podcast or an audio book that you can't get enough of now? Oh, man. Um, I, I shift a lot. I mean, I got to say, um, podcasts right now, um, just complete side note. Um, I'm also a trader. So, you know, I've been really big on trading podcasts, reading a few trading books um, and so forth. So that's been huge. I spent, you know, about an hour or so a day. Uh, on the charts. So that's been a big area for me right now. Um, I'm a, I'm a dive in kind of per, uh, person. I'm a quick learner. So I, I kind of, you know, for lack of better terms, um, immerse, fully immerse myself in something. I get really good at it. Mm-hmm. And then I find my kind of rhythm, boom, and now kind of stick and move, if you will. So that's, that's my current, yeah. one of the bigger current lanes right now um, in that regard, in terms of, you know, focus learning at this moment, right now in the past, you know, say probably three to six months. So, Very cool. Love that. And then what's what's a tool that you can't really be living without anymore right now? Like a tool that you've in, integrated into your flow of day or work or life or whatever that you, is invaluable? If I had, I, I, I might give two here. I mean, at this point, Calendly and Slack. Um, I know yeah. probably right now most people say chat GPT, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't personally jumped on that that train as much yet, um, you know. So, but for me, just keeping it simple, Calendly, you know, helps to consolidate and focus time. Like, hey, pick a time, let's, let's rock and roll kind of yep. thing. And and Slack at this point as, you know, we're acquiring companies, we're partnering with companies, quick flow communication style thing. Um, so Slack and Calendly are definitely some, some simplistic ones for me. That, uh, yeah. Very cool. Just, and then finally, one of your most invaluable pieces of advice that you can impart on somebody else. Um, take time to audit what you're doing 
and ask yourself the question that I asked, you know, is there a better way? I would say that's it. That is one of the most impactful things you could do in anything, I think, um, especially as an entrepreneur, you know, it, how many in innovations were birthed based on that same sentiment? You know, uh, I mean, yeah. how can, is there a better way this thing that I'm doing could be done? I mean, you think about any kind of normal mode of living, any aspect of life, travel. Okay, you can go from traveling on our feet to, okay, there's probably a better way. You know, okay, we can go from gasoline cars to now, you know, electric, there's probably a better, you know, so I would stop and think and take some, even, I would even schedule time in your calendar if you can, even on a weekly basis. And if you really can, on a daily basis, even if it's 20, 30 minutes per day, five, 10 minutes per day, take time to intentionally you know, allow creativity to flow and start pondering some of the problems that you're experiencing and think, okay, how can this be done better? And watch how those time investments will advance everything you do, right? You buy back time with that type of thinking. Um, yeah. So um, that's it. that's huge. Uh, so without fail, right off the bat, I'd say take time to, to think if certain things can be done uh, in a better way. Awesome. I love that. Khalil, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you and your expertise. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Definitely. Thanks, Steve. Thanks again for tuning in to Bite Sized Agency Briefs. As always, if you found value in this episode, chances are someone else will too. So please share it with your network. Also, if you know someone with expert knowledge on a topic that agency owners would love, Drop me a note. Let's get them on. Finally, find someone to hug today.